All right, good morning. I'm Jeremy Seek, and thank you for the invitation to speak this morning. Uh, so these are some of the, the students and postdocs that I've worked with, as well as uh, other faculty from uh, around, the, around the world. Um, today I wanna to talk about gradual type checking. Okay, so some of you may have heard about some of the religious wars we've had with our programming languages, uh, you know, between the static side, with, you know, languages like Fortran and Java, where everything is checked at compile time and you deal with those error messages, but then, you know, you have less errors to deal with at runtime. And then on the other side, we've got dynamically typed languages like Lisp or MATLAB or J now JavaScript is what people program the web in. These are dynamic languages. And so what I wanna tell you about today is a, um, in some sense, a resolution to this war, which is to say, hey, we can have both kinds of checking going on in the same language, in the same program even, and the programmer can control which is which. Okay? And this diagram here is meant to kind of uh, show that that border between what's dynamic and static can be fluid, can move around, you can even have values flow back and forth between the two, uh, the two sides. And maybe just to say a word about connecting this with the high performance computing, uh, that's where uh, my graduate study started. And so for me, this is really about helping those poor grad students who have to take that MATLAB code, and then they want it to run faster and have to, you know, painstakingly port it uh, to like Fortran or C++ or something to make it go fast. And so the dream is to sort of support that process instead of having to completely rewrite the code to instead uh, get, um, get the speed ups by adding type annotations and then kick in some compiler support and things like that. All right, so just a quick taste of what, of what this looks like. This is some code in, in reticulated Python. It's a variation of Python that my student Michael Vitusik has built. Uh, you can see on the left here we have some type annotations on this function. So in the blue there saying, hey, we're, we're expecting integers. Over on the right hand side, there, were no, there are no type annotations on the parameters. I've written some comments to the side to kind of explain what's going on under the hood, right? So under the hood, that X and Y parameter are, don't have a type, but they're sort of question mark. And then the compiler has to sort of deal with the two worlds. And so under the hood, it's inserting some sort of cast that says, oh, is this thing really an integer? Okay, and we'll check at runtime. Okay, and that allows these two worlds to interoperate. When values are just simple things like integers, this is pretty simple. Um, but when you start to try to send callbacks back and forth or other sort of fancier things like op, you know, object oriented languages, objects, it becomes much more complicated to deal with that interoperation. In fact, uh, when, I'm, when we started working on this challenge 10 years ago, uh, we had no idea how many challenges we were going to face uh, in the coming decades. So, um, though one thing that was sort of uh, surprising was the how fast industry started picking up on these ideas. In fact, it was it was too fast. Okay, oftentimes research has to wait two, three decades uh, before it goes into use, like for example, garbage collection took decades to use. Uh, we are already uh, getting a lot of uptake with gradual typing. TypeScript from Microsoft is already in the top 10 of most used languages. Um, but the problem is that we haven't finished all of the technologies necessary to make this work really seamlessly. We're getting close to being done, but uh, there's still some work to be done. And so here's uh, some of the earlier work. Um, I'm not gonna have time to go into any of the details. Um, uh, people sit here sitting in the audience, Sam tobin Hoshted, Matthias Polaisen are some of the names you'll see up there. Um, uh, I just want to single out a few people. Uh, it, what really got me started on this was sitting at a, uh, the Uppsala conference, listening to Kathy Gray here talk about how the Java and the scheme interoperability could happen. Uh, that really got me thinking, hey, there's something going on here. Uh, let's work on it. Um, and then also, uh, Sophia had this wonderful insight. Uh, normally, object-oriented languages use the subtyping relation to decide when like, you can pass a class, an object of a class to another uh, variable. She had this insight that you need, that really needed a fundamental change at that level, a different relation called consistency. Uh, and she was the first person to, to have that insight, which was, which was really cool. So what's going on today? Uh, for example, my colleague Ron Garcia up at UBC and some grad students uh, like Allison are thinking about how do we create a mathematical framework that guide us when we start to add more and more language features to a gradually typed language and how do we deal with that? Um, my colleague Amal here 
is, is really focusing on what happens when we take generics and mix that with gradual typing. Um, uh, so that's, that's some really neat work that was just, just recently completed. And then to finalize the last point here, the biggest challenge really right now is how to get efficient gradual typing. And, and this is something that a whole bunch of teams all over the place have been working on, including here. I've got students right now uh, working on projects, uh, my colleague Sam as well, uh, and also Matthias. So that's, that's kind of an overview of gradual typing. <laughs>